So having introduced LDPC codes, we are now looking at a graphical representation of LDPC codes that we will use for defining and implementing the decoder, and that's the so-called tenor graph. Before we are going to introduce the tenor graph, we need to introduce a little bit of terminology. And this terminology comes from the mathematical field of graph theory. And we just need a few concepts of graph theory to get started. So what is a graph? A graph is a mathematical object, and it's a mathematical object consisting of two sets. We have set V and we have a second set E. The set V, as the name suggests, contains the so-called vertices or points. So we have a set V that contains vertices V1, V2, and uh, then we have a second set E, and the second set contains edges. So this set E is a set of unordered pairs, VI, VJ, of vertices that is called an edge. So what does it mean if we have an edge? If we have an edge, it means that we put a line or we connect vertex VI with vertex VJ. So the set V is the vertex set, set E is the edge set, and vertices VI and VJ are associated with an edge VI, VJ, then they are called the end vertices. That's a graph. So let's take a look at an example. We have a graph with six vertices, V1 up to V6, and we have a set of edges. So we have a first set, first edge is a pair V1, V1, and this means we connect vertex V1 with itself, V1. So we put the vertices as points in our space. These are the vertex points, and the edges are connections of these vertices. So then we have a vertex connecting V1 with V2. This vertex, then we have a vertex connecting V1 with V3 this one, and so on. So we have another one connecting V1 to V4, we have another one connecting V2 to V3, V3 to V4, V4 to V3, so here we have parallel edges, and we have a vertex connecting V4 to V5. So that's the graph. We see vertex V6 is unconnected, so there are no edges connect V6 or connect to V6. So that's an example of a graph. And based on the graph, we can define or introduce some further terminology. So the first thing we introduce is the degree of a vertex. So the degree of a vertex, D of V, is defined as the number of edges that are incident with V. We take a vertex and then we count the number of edges. And that's the degree of this vertex. So let's take a look at the previous graph. We have V1, so we count the number of edges. We have one, two, three, four, five. So we can say that the degree of V1 is equal to five. Then we take a look at V2. We have one, two edges. So the degree of V2 is equal to two. Then V3 is 1, 2, 3, 4. So we can say that the degree of V3 is equal to 4, and so on. We can calculate the degrees of the different vertices. So this is something we have done, and we get the degrees of all the six vertices in our graph. We see that the degree of V6 is equal to 0 because there are no edges connecting to V6. Then we can immediately have a result or give um, a first result of the graph. So if we sum the degrees of all the graph, then we must end up with an even number. So if we sum all the degrees, we have 5 plus 4 equals 9, plus 1 equals 10, plus 2 equals 12, plus 4 equals 16. So that's an even number. And the even number is two times the number of edges in the graph. So it's we ended up with 16. So we means we have eight edges in the graph. We can 
count one two three four five six seven and eight and why is this that's essentially because each edge is being counted twice when we calculate the degrees so we have the leftmost part of the edge and the rightmost part of the edge the beginning and the end of the edge there's no direction associated so the two end points of the edges are counted and so each edge is counted twice so that's why the sum of the degrees is equal to two times mu so that means also uh, if we have a graph the number of vertices with an odd degree must be even that's also because um, if we have a one odd degree vertex then we can we need to put the um the endpoints somewhere and uh, from this we can infer that the number of vertices with odd degree must be even so then uh, we can define a different simpler class of graphs that's a simple graph and regular graphs so a simple graph is a graph that has no self loops and no parallel edges. That's what we call a simple graph. A regular graph is a graph where each degree or each vertex is of the same degree, which is kappa. So here are example. So the simple graph means we have no parallel edges and no self loop. So there are no edges connecting, for instance, v1 to v1, and no parallel edges. Then it's simple graph and here we have a regular graph which is of degree three so each vertex is of the same degree which is equal to three like this. okay so that's the um, simple and regular graphs now we can define a path so it's a few definitions and then we have our language so then we can define the tenor graphs we just introduce a little bit of language so what is a pass a pass is essentially an alternating sequence of vertices and edges such that each edge is incident with the preceding and the following vertex and no vertex appears more than once so it's just a pass that you go to the graph you start with a vertex then you go to an edge, via an edge to another vertex, you take an edge, go to another vertex, take an edge, go to another vertex, and so on. So for instance, this would be a pass from V1 via V2 to V3 and V4. So that would be a pass along the graph. So the number of edges on the path is the so-called length of the path. This would be a path of length three. This would be a path of length four. Okay. So then we can define the path distance. The path distance is the distance between two vertices vi and vj. And that is the length of the shortest path that we can find between v1 and vj. So let's again looking at the um, simple graph here. So the distance between V1 and V3 is equal to 1. Distance V1, V3 is equal to 1 because we can find a path that goes directly from V1 to V3. The distance from, let's say, V2 to V5 equal to pause for a moment and you can see if you find the distance between v2 and v5 so if we think about it we have two possibilities we can go this way from v2 to v5 that's of length three we can go this route that's also a route of length three um, we also have other possibilities going from V2 to V5. We can go this way, but that's of 
length four. So that's a pass of length four. So the closest, the shortest pass is of length three. So the distance between V2 and V5 is equal to three. Okay. So then we have um, something that is called a cycle. A cycle is a closed pass in the graph. So it's a pass that begins at the end, ends at the same vertex. That's called a cycle. And the number of edges is called the length of the cycle. So let's go back. Let's, for instance, look at the second example. So here we have a cycle of length four. So we start in V4, go to V1, V5, V2, back to V4. It's a cycle of length four. Here we have a cycle of length three. So we go from V2 to V1 to V3, back to V2. That's a cycle of length three. So now we can define the girth of a graph. The girth of a graph is defined as the length of the shortest cycle. So we enumerate all the cycles and then we look at which cycle is the shortest one. And that's the girth of a graph. Because if you have no cycles, the girth is infinite. So in this graph, and say the girth is equal to three, because that's the shortest cycle. We have a simple graph. A simple graph has no parallel edges, so the smallest girth of a simple graph is equal to three. And here we have a girth of three. Then if we look at this graph here, the shortest cycle is equal to four. We have this cycle that's equal to four, and we cannot find a shorter cycle. We cannot find a cycle of length three. So you can try it. If you find one, um, you do something wrong because there is no cycle of length shorter than three than four. So in this graph, the girth is equal to four. All right. So now we have these definitions. Now we introduce, um, so here, okay. what we introduce here is another example. So here's a very nice graph with a curse of five. So here the length of the shortest cycle is equal to five. Here's one example, here's another cycle of length five, here's another cycle of length five. You cannot find a cycle that is shorter than five. You can find longer cycles, so for instance, this one is, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And you have even longer cycles, but the shortest one is of length five, and therefore the girth of this graph is equal to five. Then the final object we're going to introduce is a bipartite graph. A bipartite graph is a graph where we can subdivide the vertex sets into two subsets, V1 and V2. We have a vertex set V can be decomposed into disjoint subsets V1 and V2. And every edge in E joins a vertex in V1 and a vertex in V2. So the edges connect a vertex from V1 with a vertex of V2. There are no connections within V1, no connections within V2, but we only connect V1 with V2. So no two vertices in either V1 or V2 are connected and every edge in E joins a vertex in V1 with a vertex in V2. And this means in such a graph, all the cycles have even lengths. Because we always need to go from V1 to V2 and back to V1. So we always have an even number of passes that we need to go. So let's take a look at the bipartite graph. Here is a bipartite graph. Over here is the set V1 and here is the set V2. And we see that the connection, the edges always connect an edge from V1 and vertex from V1 with a vertex from V2. 
always an edge, vertex from V1 with a vertex from V2. This again is a regular graph because the degree of each vertex is even equal to 3. We can try to see if we find the shortest cycle. Let's take a look. This one, this is not so easy. Here is, there is one cycle even like this. So this is a cycle of one, length one, two, three, four, five, six. We have a cycle of length six. Um, maybe, I don't know if there is a cycle of length four, but this is something that you can try. So uh, if you want to spend some time, try figuring out what is the girl's of this graph. We know the girls must be even because every cycle has an even length. So the smallest possible girls is equal to 4. We know that the girls must be an element from 2. Um, sorry, 2 cannot happen because we don't have parallel edges in this graph. This is something we see immediately. If we have parallel edges, the girls is equal to 2 because then we go from 1 back. Here we have no parallel edges, so the cusp is either 4, 6, 8, and so on. So it's an even number larger or equal than 4. So that's a bipartite graph, and bipartite graphs are the ones that we are going to use to represent LDP curves. And this is the so-called tenor graph of a code. Tenor graph because it was invented by Michael Tenor. So, how is a tenor graph constructed? So, we start with an LDPC code. It has a parity check matrix H of size M times N. It doesn't need to be an LDPC code. It, can, it works for every binary linear code. So we need a binary and we need a linear code. And it can be any code. So, the tenor graph is a bipartite graph. So it means we have two classes of vertices, and every edge connects a vertex from the first class to the second class. So what are these two classes? So we have, we start with a V1, and V1 are the so-called variable nodes. And we have a total number of n variable nodes, and each of variable node corresponds to a bit in a code word. So every variable node corresponds to a bit in the code word xi, and hence it corresponds to a column of the parity check matrix because each column corresponds to a bit in the code word. That are the variable nodes. Then we have the check nodes. V2 are the check nodes. And we have a total number of m um, check nodes. And each check node corresponds to a parity check constraint or a row of the parity check matrix H. So for every row in the matrix, we put a parity check node. Every column in the matrix, we put a variable node. And now we need to connect those. So how do we connect those? Well, that depends on the parity check matrix. So we, we connect check node CJ connected with an edge to variable node xi. If h is 1 at position ji, so in row j and column i, we have a 1. That means we connect the two nodes. Then we say the variable number i participates in the parity check constraint number j. So let's do an example, and then it's getting very clear quickly, I guess. So as an example, we do the Hamming code. We have a Hamming code with this parity check matrix, and this Hamming code is the code that we're going to start with. So if we count, this Hamming code has seven code bits. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we put down seven variable nodes, x1 to x7. To distinguish variable nodes from check nodes, we use different type of nodes. So we use 
We use circles to denote variable nodes, and we're going to use squares to denote check nodes. So we have our seven variable nodes. Now we're going to draw the check nodes one by one. So we start with the first check node. The first check node corresponds to the first row of the parity check matrix. So we put a square node, that's the first check node, and we use the red color to denote that there is the correspondence. Then we have a one in the first column, so we connect the first check node to x1. We have a one in the second column, so we connect it to x2. We have a one in the third column, so we connect it to x3. Then we have a one in the fifth column, so we connect it to x5. And we have zeros everywhere else, so we don't do connections. So what this means is also, this first row means that x1 plus x2 plus x3 plus x5 must be equal to zero. That's the first check constraint. Okay, so we have the first um, check note. Now we continue with the second one. So the second one is the green row. So we put another node and we have a one connecting the first column. So we connect to X1. We have a one in the second column. We connect to X2. We have a one in the fourth column. We connect to X4. And we have a one in the sixth column. So we connect to X6. That also means that X1 plus X2 plus X4 plus X6 must be equal to zero. Okay, now the final column. So final column, again, we put a check node, C3. And um, we have a one in the first column, so we connect to X1. We have a one in the third column, connect to X3. One in the fourth column, connect to X4. And we have a one in the final column, so we connect to X7. So it also means that x1 plus x3 plus x4 plus x7 must be equal to zero. Okay, so that is the um, telegraph representation of the 7 for heavy code. That's it. So usually we remove the colors, but that's the telegraph representation of the 7 for heavy code. So now we take a look at the LEPC code. So an LEPC code has parameters dv equals three and dc equals six. So it means that we have three runs in each column and six ones in each row. Okay, so this is the matrix that I constructed randomly. And now uh, we remove the zeros, just for clarity. Now we're going to construct the tenor graph of for this code. And again, you're welcome to take a sheet of paper, pause the video and try to do it for yourself. It's a very, very good exercise. And uh, then you can compare it with the result that we're going to see on the next slide. So this is the code. So we have, in this case, 20 variable nodes, because if you look at the matrix, we have 20 columns in the matrix. We have 10 rows, so we should have 10 check nodes. You see, we have 10 check nodes. And we use different colors, and um, we have our connections here. So we also see that every variable node has a degree of three. So it has three outgoing edges. So the degree of xi is equal to three. That's dv. Mm -hmm. So now it should also be clear why we call this dv. That's the degree of the variable nodes. So this notation comes from the graph representation. And we're looking at graph-based codes. So the graph representation is the one that defines the code, not the parity check matrix. Parity check matrix is just the traditional way of writing it, but the graph is what we are looking at. We have a variable node degree of three. That's why this is called dv. You can also see that the 
degree of every check node cj is equal to 6 and that's dc. Now it also becomes obvious why we call this dc. It's the degree of the check nodes, therefore c, subscript c. So therefore we see that dc and dv that define the parameters of the code, they come from this graph representation of the code and therefore this graph representation is very, very important. It's going to be very important also for deriving the decoder later on. All right, so we have the graph representation. Here's another example, this big guy here. That's the tenor graph again for a tree six LDPC code with 60 variable nodes and 30 check nodes. So for clarity, I just rotate this guy by 90 degrees. So the variable nodes are on top. I hope you see that they are small circles and the check nodes are on the bottom. So you see that they are small squares. And this is a tenor graph. You see it's getting very quickly yeah, impractical to visualize, but representing this graph in a computer is very efficient. And we have very good libraries for representing graphs in computers. And the decoder essentially will be based on this graphical representation. So this graph is very important for looking at what's going on in the decoder. That's what we're going to see in the next chapter. So next chapter is going to be how to use the graph for deriving a decoder.